Want to break down on some of the latest topics from Cars to the Pros? We interview many individuals to share their knowledge about the news stories surrounding the teams and its players. This is nothing but that sports talk. And welcome back to another episode of Nothing But That Sports Talk. I'm Afriku Zung alongside Jasmine Brown. And I understand it's been a very long and stressful two weeks of no sports going on for you. What's it like? Yeah, but what is even harder is that you got some people losing their jobs. I mean, you lost your job with ESPN, overtime trade is not overtime trade no more, and um, a couple of other people losing their jobs and stuff. It's just kind of tough. And um, I, I said you, you said recently you got laid off of your job at ESPN. How was that tough for you? How was that? Ha- <sighs> recently you just got laid off of your job at ESPN. How was that like for you? Look at the bright side. ESPN is a huge resume builder for you. You can easily go back and work another position when when sports comes back. So, if you had the option to go back to ESPN, would you do it? Yeah, I've seen you do a lot of editing stuff for ESPN. Like, what is the number one video that you edited when you was working for ESPN? Number one thing, uh, hmm. I have to definitely say the WNBA game with the uh, Sky and the Aces in the playoffs last year, when Derek and Hamby's game-winning shot. That was probably the biggest thing that I did because it wasn't really in any shows. Um, and then when the, the buzzer beater hit, that's when it got into all the shows. So I had to cut for like four different shows. It was pretty big. <laughs> oh, what buzzer beater? You talking about this buzzer beater? Sloot looks at the clock, daring them to foul her. That's a dangerous pass. Hamby. Jonah, what you get me to it? What a defensive play here by Hamby. Chicago was arguing that Hamby may have gone out of bounds. She had zero clock awareness. Man, that shot by Jericho Hamby was just ridiculous. And the fact that you did it with just a couple seconds on the clock is just, that's one of those shiny moments you see in WNBA playoffs. And I hope you get more of that this season coming up. Yeah. Hopefully you can see that. Well, the NBA's regular season could go into August. So imagine having to watch the NBA and the WBA at the same time. It's going to be a freaking viewers fest. Yeah, definitely. Um, I do think, I, I don't know, depending on how everything goes. I mean, another step, what, like 17 ish games in the NBA regular season. Um, but I just think with that, the WBA might take a step, step back in viewership. I don't know. I hope not. Um, but I, I, that's what I'm kind of not hoping happens. So, I don't know. We'll see. It's, it's going to be a cluster of mess of <laughs> stuff when it yeah. comes back. 
Speaking of the WNBA, you mentioned the draft is coming up. What do you think about the way ESPN is handling the draft with everything going on? Uh, I think they're handling it well. I know they did have some backlash with um, having it on ESPN, too, and then they changed it. Um, but I think it's going to be ESPN, which was the right move. I don't know why you would continue to still put something on ESPN, you know, too. Second day, there's nothing going on. It's, it's absolutely nothing going on. So um, they did the right move with putting uh, the draft on ESPN, too. It's virtual. I mean, on, on the main channel, it's virtual. So, um, you know, maybe they can get creative with it and see how they can pull it off. Yeah, and as somebody working that used to work for ESPN, Creativity is no joke in there. And when the draft happens, we know that Steph, that Sabrina is going to get drafted number one. What do you think is going to be like the, the next two players after her? And how will they impact the game of the WNBA when it comes back? Jasmine, the New York Liberty are not like the New York Knicks, where they like literally stink up in every single draft pick that they got, mm-hmm. including R.J. Barrett. But what do you think R.J. Barrett looking like in the WNBA? I mean, excuse me, in the NBA? Uh, I mean, I I think well, from what I'm saying, he was playing well. I think um, it's always hard to go to the Knicks. It is. It doesn't matter what coach it is. Doesn't matter what um, what players you have. It's it's, it's hard. It's going to be a while for the Knicks to rebuild back up. Um, but R.J. Barrett's playing really well. Um, I do think Ja and uh, Zion kind of uh, a little bit um, overpowering just because of the, their, their ability. But uh, R.J. is doing very well, um, and he definitely is a good uh, contributor to the team. So I would like to see – I'll be and I'm excited to see how he plays going forward. Yeah, especially with Zion Williamson having the the best career of his life in early in his NBA days. Like, <laughs> what do you think about Zion Williamson in the NBA right now? He's a monster. I did not think he would. Uh, I didn't think that the Pelicans were going to have any shot at the playoffs when he came back. I thought he was going to be rusty. I thought that, you know they were going to kind of kind of go through the motions, and so maybe next year when he's fully healthy, but. I mean, they were what? I don't even know. I don't even know what their seating was. Were they nine or eight? I think I'm not sure. But they, they, but they could go to the playoffs. You know, depending on the climate of how the NBA is when it comes back. But I mean, I didn't think they would vault that high in the Western Conference like that. Yeah, but unlike the New York Knicks, at least with Zion Williamson on the Pelicans, it won't take them that long before they can come back and be a playoff juggernaut. Unlike the days where they had Anthony Davis. I mean, even though Anthony Davis did win the playoff series playing for the Pelicans, Zion Williamson is the next big thing. And all we could do is hope that he lives up to that. Exactly. I think he will. Yeah. And um, let's flip into some baseball talk. Like, when the season comes back, what do the Nationals have to do to reclaim their championship if there is, is a season? Um, yeah, I mean, they just have to, you know, do what they got to do. Um, 
play better, don't come from behind and play again, which I don't think they will do. Um, but they just have to play through um, what people, you know, can give their best shot to. They won't, they won't be the Astros. Everybody's not going to hate them. So <laughs> that's not going to be a thing. But, you know, they have to expect everybody's best shot. <laughs> Yeah. Speaking of the Astros, what went through your mind when you found out that the Astros cheated to win the World Series in 2017? I was definitely hurt. I'm a Dodgers fan, actually. So, um, I was very upset when I saw that. So, uh, I was, uh, I was very, I was very, I was very mad. Um, and then the Red Sox, you know, lost to the Red Sox the following year. And I was just like, really? Again? So, I was kind of playing around with somebody. I was like, if the Nationals cheated, you know, the same, they cheated, then I, I would just be done. I, I wouldn't even watch anymore because <laughs> third time, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, I kind of knew, I knew it was something with the, with the Astros. I knew it. It was just too much that they were doing. And people call, call me crazy for, for hating because I was hating on them. I was like, I'm not hating on them. I just see something wrong. But, um, Whatever I was feeling was right, so <laughs> that's that. They just lucky they didn't have their title vacated just because of that, because the, yeah. the sports league is no joke when it comes to disciplining their players for their cheating on the field. Mm -hmm. Now, on to a different topic. Why don't you name your top five MLB players of all time coming to the season? But you want to know what is tough with going into the season is that Noah Syndergaard got hurt again and he's going to miss the entire 2020 season even if it still happens. What do you think about that? That's tough. Um, I think they just might have to shut that down because um, <laughs> it's, it's hard when you're, and you're playing like, what, 160 some games. So, you know, it's a lot a lot of motion, a lot of stuff like that. I think they have, they have said that, shut that down. Um, hope is lost for that team. Sorry. <laughs> That's the same thing we thought with the New York match before they had that astounding month of August, and then they just yeah. could not make the playoffs. Though yeah. they did end it on an epic note with a walk-off home run at the last game of the regular season. They did, yeah. But they still didn't make the playoffs because Milwaukee was just too tough to catch up with. And, of course, the Nationals... They were tough to catch up with as well, especially when they blew a ninth inning lead in a game against them in the month of September. They won the series, but that one right. loss. Yeah. The Knights. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> That's all I can say. Yeah. 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 On to some better NBA news. Christian Wood is fully healed. What do you think about that? <laughs> was Gobert and um, uh, what's his face? Donovan, uh, Donovan. So um, very glad to hear that he fully recovered. Um, I know I saw Gobert say that he lost his his uh, taste and his smell. So I don't know if it's, it's really like full blown. Um, but I'm really happy for Christian Wood. He was having a really good season. Um, and I know they need him. So, mm -hmm. very glad that he recovered and he um, can come back at the end of the season. Yeah. And I know before you started working for ESPN that you had to cover some Washington Mystics and some the Go-Go -Go Washington Wizards G League affiliates. Is there any possibility you're going to go back to doing that this season? It's a possibility. Um, you know, if I go back home, um, definitely... Uh, 
Uh, the Mystics, another go-go season is pretty much over. Um, but the Mystics, you know, if they have a season, yeah, I'll definitely go back. I miss it. Um, miss them a lot. Um, my favorite player is leaving, though. She told me she's going back to Sparks. So a little bit sad about that. Um, but, yeah, I would love to go back home and cover them because I had a lot of fun. I miss being on the court, being in the arena, being around you know, the atmosphere and stuff like that. Yeah, and being around other women in sports doing some serious coverage. And uh, to all the players, to all the people that are trying to get into the sports broadcasting world, including people that are non-former athletes, what you what advice you have for the non-former athletes that are trying to do sports journalism? Yeah, you know, um, the greatest thing about it is if you don't have a degree in journalism, you can, you can just still do it. Um, I didn't get my degree in journalism. Um, but, you know, if you have a strong passion for it, just put your mind to it and get working. I mean, before I got to ESPN, I did a lot of things, uh, non-paid, but it was my passion, and it opened doors for me. So um, just just having the mindset of I want to do this, and I stuck with that plan, it helped me to uh, execute my vision, which led to different opportunities that ended up being paid. So um, I'm not, you know, of course not right now, but um, it definitely helps uh, just having a vision and just executing that plan. So have a plan, execute it, and don't waver for, uh, from it. Yeah. And I know during your time at ESPN, you had your friend Monica McNutt, who was an older special guest of my podcast, visit your job. Like, what, what are your impressions about the type of work that Monica McNutt is doing in the sports world? That's a real dog. She's amazing. I actually just talked to her two days ago. Um, but actually, no, yeah, two days ago. But, um, I mean, she's everywhere. She's a baller. She's amazing. Um, you know, just seeing her growth is, is remarkable. I'm very, very proud of her. Um, you know, just seeing her travel to cover. I saw her do the Paul game. What she's doing, you know, was going to do the ACC. Um, well, she did the ACC Women's Tournament. Um, you know, then going back up to Bristol to go to the studio and then going to New York. I mean, she's all over the place, which is more motivation for me, you know, to travel and, you know, take opportunities that uh, I want to do. And she's definitely a big inspiration, and I'm very proud of her for what she's doing. Yeah, she's and she's very responsive with all the people that managed to get in contact with her, including that one day where I was actually showcasing her on Instagram Live, and they showed her like two different channels at the same time live. That was just so oh, yeah, weird. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know how is that even possible for a woman. Right. Like she's literally everywhere. Mm-hmm. And that's what you need. That's what we need. She's great. Hopefully we can get more people like that, um, especially black women like that too. Yeah. And um, what are the most positive experiences you take from working for ESPN and how you plan to use it for your next opportunity? Uh, you know, I think the the pace of the network is definitely something that um, I wasn't used to going in, but uh, after, you know, being in it, working in it, uh, definitely have a understanding of how it runs and the pacing and the timing of everything that needs to air, uh, edit, be you know, put together. Uh, that's definitely something I learned. Also, you know, just having ideas, um, pitching ideas, and just overall just networking and putting video together. I know, you know, my downtime there, I made videos of just things that I, you know, was thinking of and just kind of use their resources to my advantage um, because, you know, we don't really have that uh, advantage with the resources that, that they have as far as archive games, um, you know, archive games, regular games, that are, games that are, you know, resumed, but uh, it was a lot, it was a lot um, of things that I didn't know. That I do know now. I know how to, I know how to operate stuff when breaking news happens. I know how to operate when you know somebody's out for the season or you know just anything. So um, definitely grateful for the experience, and I hope that I can take that somewhere else wherever I go. Yeah, and um, 
I know it's, far, it's not just heartbreaking for the sports world as far as not having any sports, but it was also heartbreaking earlier this year that we lost a living legend who used to play for the Lakers and had the greatest 20 years of his life and another great three years add on to it before the crash had burned. What went through your mind when that happened? It's kind of funny because that Sunday I was actually doing the podcast um, when it happened. And I was talking about, like, the first question I was asked was, how, was I, how did I get into basketball? And, um, you know, I said I grew up watching Kobe um, and all those guys. So um, as that happened, um, I got the news about 15 minutes later, and I was just in disbelief. I was crying all day. You know, it was just a lot. Um, and uh, my mom, she was telling me, that, you know, I understand why you hurt. I mean, Kobe was your boy. So um, she, said, she said I talked about it all the time, which I don't remember. But she said that I did. So um, it was definitely heartbreaking to uh, see that and the way that it happened. You know, I, I really wanted it to be fake, but it wasn't. But, I mean. I know we were all blessed to see him uh, in his career, and you know, blessed to see you know him retire, and blessed to see him advocate for things that he wanted to do. He was really enjoying retired life, and it showed. Um, we saw him in a different light on the other side of the ball, and then also advocating for women's sports, uh, women's sports, and women's basketball in the WNBA. Um, I do believe that if Gianna was still alive, she would be in there, and he'll be there, and the WNBA would have. It really would have probably, I wouldn't say repl- replicate what happened with, in the 90s with, you know, the comments and all that, but it definitely would have um, got some eyeballs um, back yeah. more eyeballs back in. The way I found out that, that Kobe Bryant passed away was just so surreal. I'm watching a Maryland game on CBS. Um, I, it just, just the fact that it happened, I was just re-watching his old highlights, including the sick highlights he put up at Rucker Park. Mm-hmm. Name one highlight or, matter of fact, three highlights that you enjoyed from Kobe Bryant's career in the NBA. Uh, definitely. Um, definitely the, the 2010 championship. Uh, that was definitely um, my favorite. Now, there was one game, I think. I don't know if they were playing. I don't know if they were playing the Pistons. Or, I think they were playing the Pistons. Um, he, I think it was halftime. It was like. Point four seconds on the clock, and he just threw the ball in. Um, I forgot who he threw the ball to. I don't know if it was Clark, Earl Clark, or some. I, I may, it may have been, might have been him. But he just threw the ball in and tipped it in at the buzzer. Like that was amazing. His awareness just to see um, and then get it off. It was really amazing. Um, very underrated one for me. I think we'll talk about that. And then, of course, number one is definitely the the. 60, 61 points, 60 points that he put up um, in, the, in his final game. That was, like, the best. Kobe Bryant was just out of his mind during his last few minutes of his career that night. And when I watched that, all I could say is I expected nothing less from the Black Mamba. Mm-hmm. Definitely. <laughs> I, know he would, I know if he was alive right now, he would have been disappointed that we're sitting here, no yeah. sports going around. But mm-hmm. And we also have no March Madness going on this year. But why don't you name your three favorite March Madness moments in your life from when you started watching sports? Huh, let me see. Um, definitely when Lehigh beat Duke. That was definitely a, uh, a highlight of mine. I love that. Um, I, I hate Duke. I mean, I'm a Turk, so I, barely, I hate Duke. <laughs> um, but... Uh, that was definitely a big highlight for me. Uh, I think the second one, uh, it was a great, I think, great game for me. The, of course, is the Chrissy Tolliver shot um, against Duke. Again, sorry, all Duke stuff. Uh, but, I mean, it was a, the shot. I mean, they call it the shot. Um, hopefully they have a documentary on that because that was a really great, really great year for them. Um Number one is a toss-up between a toss-up between Maryland um, beating Indiana in, in their first championship and um, 
Villanova, North Carolina. I, I'll probably have to go with Villanova, North Carolina. Uh, Chris Jenkins hitting that shot was just amazing because, you know, you're hitting that and Michael Jordan is there. <laughs> like, it's, it, it was a great shot. Yeah, and I know you were tight as a North Carolina Tar Heel fan that happened. I've heard stories from many people, people well, from when they watched the North Carolina Tar Heels get hit at, lose at the buzzer that game. I was just thoughts. Oh, yeah. man. Are you a Tar Heel? Nah, actually, I, well, I'm all around when it comes to college basketball. I don't not, I mean, like, whatever college basketball moment happens, it's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Including a certain collapse in the 2016 March Madness Tournament courtesy of Texas A&M. What you think about that back then? That was a really, I did not, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that. I mean, they, I mean, just ball going out of bounds. They missing the layup. And I, the, the, when they, when, when they, the ball went, deflected off, I don't know who it was, but went out of bounds. I, at that point, I just knew, okay, <laughs> this is not happening. I think they, they lost that lead in like, what, a minute and 30? Like, yeah, a minute and 30. Had to be like, yeah, like 60, 70 seconds. Like, I mean, I, I couldn't believe that one. That was ridiculous. I was actually just watching that last month. I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, SB Nation was talking about how was, that I was the worst collapse in March Madness history. Oh, yeah, definitely. It was. It was. Because. It was no, it was no reason. I can see a back and forth, but, I mean, you, you literally let that league go away to a mid-major at that. Yeah. But what is their favorite March Madness highlights from the women's side? Women's side, of course. Because right. obviously I know Akira Gulawawe's two straight buzzer beaters in the 2018 March Madness tournament has to be up there. Of course. Um, I would definitely I would definitely put that's there. Uh, I'm trying to figure out which one I would do. I think the one where she hit, when she hit it against UConn, I think I would definitely put that one there. Um, I think my other one um, would be hmm. Other one I think was when um, South Carolina won the championship. I love that one. Asia Wilson uh, that team that was definitely a really good uh, win. I like to see. I love. I love Dawn Staley. So that was definitely one of my favorite moments. Um, my my number one though is definitely Morgan Williams when she hit that buzzer against UConn. Um, I don't think anybody saw UConn going down like that. Um, and even Gino was like, "Wow, oh my gosh!" So the, uh, I think I think that shot right there is number one for me forever because. That shot opened up um, everybody else in that landscape. And I think everybody saw, the girls in high school, girls in college, they saw that uh, you don't have to go to UConn anymore. You can go everywhere else. And, you know, it's not just UConn stacked up anymore. So I think even though Enrique hit the shot, you know, and won national championship after beating UConn, I think Morgan Williams' shot opened up the um opened up the eyes of everybody and that opened the vault of girls committing to schools that were not just UConn because now you're seeing a balanced power with schools now and you know what's crazy UConn has been known to be one of the winning schools in both the men's and women's sides on the men's side latest Cardia Kemba in 2011 when you look back at Cardia Kemba in 2011 what went through your mind because that, that that has to be the start of Cardia Kemba's career in basketball right there. Definitely. Um, I think <laughs> that UConn team was de- definitely uh, <laughs> that, that wasn't supposed to happen. Um, it, I mean, I think that's one of my favorite moments too. Um, the men and women winning it, you know, that same year. Uh, yeah, I mean, Kem- Kemba Walker was, he was a beast. And um, it definitely, I think, I, I think if you, was put in a better situation, um, you know, than, than Charlotte. I think definitely would have had a better career. Sorry, I'm sorry about that. Um, if he would have had, but definitely had a better career, I think overall, and kind of been starting to be 
put in those lists for all time, not all time, but you know, you know, creep it up in there. Um, but I mean, everybody knows he's a beast, and everybody will re- remember him from that year called team. Yeah. It's just a lot to take in. We have no March Madness going on. But you know what? Let's just hope that we have some live March Madness games to talk about in 2021. As we come to the end of this episode of my Nothing But That Sports Talk. Thank you, Johnson Brown, for stopping by. I know this has been a tough week for you. And I, know, and I wish you good luck in your future media endeavors. I really do. Because ESPN is a straight, strong resume builder. Definitely. Thank you. I appreciate it. And to all the balls out there, stay quarantined and get your head in the game.